And you have rescued us through Jesus Christ. Through his death and resurrection, you have bought us back. You have given us life when we deserve death. And so, Father, today we thank you for your love. We thank you by proclaiming our love for you, by bringing our, our, our voices, our bodies, ourselves, and offering them to you as a sacrifice. So, Father, this, this morning we simply pray that as we worship you, as we open your word, that we would hear your voice and we would be changed through the power of Jesus Christ. It's in his name we ask this. Amen. Hi, my name's Howard, and I'd like to share my journey to freedom with you. Picture in your mind, 13-year-old boy riding around on his bike with his buddies. We find on the curb a magazine that isn't quite appropriate for our age, a pornographic magazine. We all look at it, but I take it home. I find myself enamored with it, and now I'm, I'm on the road to an addiction that, that spans 40 years. That magazine changed my life. Three years from that point, I found Christ uh, at a retreat, and I gave my life to Him. But I still had those desires. Obviously, masturbation became a problem. Um, I would seek, seek out magazines any way I could through uncles who had them laying around, and I'd borrow them and not return them. I started into architectural school and found myself really pulled toward ministry and I proceeded to go into going to in ministry school I was gone about six months and and uh, found came back home for for a break and found out my girlfriend was pregnant so I did the right thing and married her we had three great kids best on the planet if you ask me but that issue over the over the course of a 20-year marriage was still there a demon in my back pocket as I call it it would continue to rear its ugly head when my wife and I didn't have time for each other. It finally led to uh, infidelity. During my marriage, I never saw it as a problem. I didn't think it was doing any harm to, to the relationship, but obviously with neglecting my wife and her needs, it, it was monumental damage. I was single for a time, and during that time, that problem never went away. I met a gal, great woman, married to her today, and brought that same problem into a second marriage. That second marriage is still intact and, and stronger than ever. I was uh, involved in a men's fellowship here at, here at Calvary. Great group of guys, and the Lord just really told me that I needed to share this. And I'm telling you, the minute I shared it, there was relief. Knowing that it was out of the closet, it was no longer hid, and it could be dealt with. These guys stepped up, held me accountable, and helped me get past it. And the moment that confession came out of my mouth, there was a relief. It was no longer hid, it was no, no, no longer a dark secret. Since that time, since I had the opportunity to share with those men, the freedom that I've experienced is unbelievable. In all sincerity, uh, I've, I've come 180 degrees from that point. It's not an issue anymore. God literally took it away. If you don't believe in miracles, I'll tell you about one. And that's exactly what took place. Those drives, desires are gone. God has restored me and redeemed me to allow me to, to, to be involved in, in ministry and to be able to serve and to help out wherever I can. And that's the redemption of this whole thing is that he brought me full circle. 40 years in the wilderness, and today I can stand before you and say, I've been renewed. I appreciate the stories that are talking about their journey to freedom. And today we're continuing in our series, Journey to Freedom. We're looking at the Exodus event in the book of... Exodus. Uh, and uh, if you got a Bible or a Bible app on your device, turn to uh, Exodus chapter 6. We're actually going to be looking at six chapters or the story in six chapters. Don't worry, not going to read it all for your sake and mine. Uh, but, uh, but I would encourage you to go home uh, and sometime this week read Exodus 6 through 12. It's the story of the, 
the, the event, the highlights of it, and, and we're going to be kind of talking through this. If you don't have a Bible with you, grab one of the Bibles in the pews around you, look just like this, and, uh, and, and feel free to use it. Uh, Exodus 12 is on page 69, if that helps. It's way back at the front of the book. And if you need a Bible, then take one of these with you. We want you to have the Word of God and let it speak into your life, because uh, we know it'll change your life. Uh, I want to start off with a quote from uh, Celebrate Recovery. Uh, Celebrate Recovery is one of the ministries here at Calvary, and I'm a huge fan of it. Uh, it goes like this. The journey to freedom begins when your pain is greater than your fear of change. Um, when your pain is greater than your fear of change and you're willing to do something about the pain. And, and we try so hard to avoid pain, don't we? Try to numb the pain, try to escape the pain or whine about it or blame somebody. And yet once we discover that we must follow God through the pain, then we're on the path to freedom. So uh, today we're continuing this Journey to Freedom series looking at Exodus. And, and we see that God delivered his people through pain. God delivered his people through pain. Uh, a couple weeks ago, we kicked this off. We talked about Moses and how Moses was uh, really just doing his own thing. And God called him to lead the Israelites to freedom. And uh, he didn't want to do it. Uh, and he resisted and he protested and he tried to get out of it. And finally, he said, okay, I'll do that. Uh, and he goes to Egypt and uh, he comes to the Israelites and he tells them, hey, God sent me. He heard your prayers. He's going to answer them. I'm going to lead you to freedom. He goes to, to Pharaoh and Pharaoh laughs him out of there. Tells him no, uh, makes it harder on the Israelites. The Israelites get mad at Moses. Uh, Pharaoh doesn't like Moses. Moses is angry at God. He's complaining to God. He's saying, you're not doing it the way you, uh, I thought you were going to do this. And, and it's not working out. And we come to Exodus 6, 1, which is kind of the beginning of this, this whole story. And, and here's what God says to Moses. It says, the Lord said to Moses, now you will see what I will do to Pharaoh. For with a strong hand he will send them out, and with a strong hand he will drive them out of this land. So God said, look, Moses, I'm going to show you my power. You're going to see what I can do. And so Moses went to Pharaoh, and he said, let God's people go. And Pharaoh said, no. Over and over and over again he said no. And so God revealed his power in the plagues. God convinced Pharaoh, but it took ten plagues to do it. And the plagues were these, you know, great natural disasters that came upon Egypt. Some of them the whole land, some of them just the Egyptians. And God used ten of them. He started off with, you know, minor things like turning the Nile to blood. It's kind of gross, uh, kind of dramatic. But the whole river turned to blood. And, and, and then it was an invasion of frogs. And then it was gnats. And then it was flies. And then it was, you know, all these different kinds of things that happened to try to convince the people and, and, and it went to the death of livestock and boils and hail and locusts and three days of darkness. And finally the death of the firstborn. Now by the way, the, the people of God were affected by at least half of these. They, and it wasn't just like the Egyptians only. It was, it was the whole land of Egypt for some of them. Some of them excluded the Israelites because God wanted to show Pharaoh his power in the plagues. And after each plague, you know, Moses would come back to Pharaoh and he'd go, Now? You know, let us go now? How about now? And Pharaoh continually showed resistance. So let's talk about Pharaoh's resistance. Uh, he, he moves in these six chapters from being hard-hearted to being harder-hearted to being broken. And even when his own advisors are saying, hey, let him go. Let him get out of here. They're destroying our nation. His pride won't let him do it. He's just like, no, I'm not going to yield to these Israelite slaves in fact, Pharaoh doesn't change his mind until his pain becomes too great when his own child dies. And, and that leads us to the Passover. The Passover is connected to the final plague. The final plague is the death of the firstborn. God says, here's what I'm going to do to finally get uh, Pharaoh to let the Israelites go. Uh, I'm going to send my death angel through the whole land of Egypt. And he's going to kill the firstborn of every household in the country. You know, because Pharaoh has resisted my, my power, uh, I'm going to convince him. And here's what's going to happen. If you are a follower of God, then you take a lamb and you kill the lamb and you take the blood and you put it on your doorposts. And in that evening when the death angel comes across the entire land of Egypt, he sees the blood on the doorpost and he will pass over that house. That's where the name Passover came from. 
It, it was literally that the, the angel of death passed over those people who belonged to God, who listened to God and did what he said. And, and so the Israelites did that. And, of course, they lived, and the Egyptians didn't do it, and they suffered loss, and Pharaoh suffered the loss of his child, and he was broken, and through the pain, the Israelites were freed. And they found their journey to freedom through the pain. Now, I want to pause the story right there just for a moment and and just connect some dots for you. The the Passover was the meal that Jesus gathered with his disciples to celebrate the night that he was betrayed. The night that he instituted the Last Supper, what we celebrate as communion. And, And so Jesus was connecting himself to the Passover lamb. The lamb whose blood was used to to have the death angel pass over and give them life. He's the lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And whenever you hear the term Passover used, or whenever you come to celebrate communion, realize that we're talking about Jesus connecting his body that was broken and his blood that was shed to the lamb that was used to deliver the Israelites to freedom. And just as God used that lamb, that Passover lamb, 4,000 years ago to set the Israelites free, God uses the blood of Jesus, his one and only son, to set us free from our captivity to sin. Connect those dots and understand the significance, especially later on in this service when we celebrate communion together. So God set his people free through the pain. What does that mean for us? What do we need to learn about this for our journey to freedom? Uh, Let me share some thoughts with you on your own journey to freedom and how this can help. First of all, our choices result in pain for ourselves and others. Pharaoh's decisions resulted in destruction for his nation and loss for himself. And he had no one to blame but himself. I I mean, think about it. Moses came to him and said, Pharaoh, let God's people go. And Pharaoh said, no. And Moses said, if you don't let them go, here's what's going to happen. And Pharaoh said, go for it. He still said no. He, he took the consequences knowing what was going to happen. Now, I get that for the first couple of plagues, you know, maybe, right? Coincidence or something. But at what point do you, like, start paying attention, like, what he's going to say is really going to happen? You know, does it take you three, four, five? It took Pharaoh ten. Ten times. And look at all the pain that he suffered in doing that, in resisting God and saying, no, I'm not going to do what God wants. Let me be kind of blunt here. You and I are responsible for much of the pain in our lives and we're hurting others. And I think that's one of the reasons that Pharaoh is such a big deal in this story. It, why, why he continues to go over and over and over again. No, I'm not going no, to do what God wants. No, I'm going to embrace the pain. He makes those choices because that's what you and I do. Isn't it? I mean, we look at Pharaoh, and, and when I read the story, and if you read the story this week, you'll go, you guy's an idiot. I mean, why in the world didn't he like, you know, give in after you know, flies that infested everything? You know, what about the locusts? Why did he, why did he have to wait? But look at our own lives. Look at how many times we know the right thing to do. Look at how many times that that we can read the Word of God or hear the Word of God or God can just speak into our lives and yet we still resist His way. We want to do it our way. We want to to come up with our plan because we think it's better than God's. And yet God warns us in Scripture. How about these words of the Apostle Paul, his letter to the church at Galatia? He says this, Do not be deceived. Can't you love it when somebody starts off that way? Don't be deceived. Don't be fooled. Don't kid yourselves. God is not mocked. You're not going to get away with this. Well, for whatever one sows, that will he also reap. For the one who sows to his own flesh will from the flesh reap corruption. But the one who sows to the Spirit will from the Spirit reap eternal life. In other words, we're going to reap what we sow. There's no way around that. We're not going to get... a Fast one over on God. We're not going to get away with it. Each one of us is going to reap what we sow. And if we go ahead and do life our way, then it's going to hurt us. And by the way, God's told us this in black and white. He's told us, hey, here's how I want you to live. Here's the the way I want you to relate to each other. Here's the way I want you to worship me. Here's the way you're going to honor me. Here's the way I'm going to bless you. 
And then what do we do? Yeah, that's nice, but I think I'll just do it my own way. And God tells us where it's going to lead us, and, and then we get angry because life hurts. So we reap what we sow. And, and there are no victimless crimes. There are no ways that you can just go, ah, this is just only for me. It's not going to impact anyone else. I mean, look at pornography. Well, actually, don't look at pornography, okay? <laughs> and my preacher said, you think pornography isn't hurting anyone? The world tells us, oh, it's, it's no problem. It's, it's no harm. Uh, and we're deceived. We're deceived. You just heard Howard's testimony, how it destroyed his life and, and took him away from the path that God had him on, ruined a marriage. I, I'm just going to tell you this, guys. If you're looking at pornography, it destroys your capacity for intimacy. Scientific studies have shown it reroutes your brain. It actually disables your brain from being able to bring your whole self into a relationship. And by the way, that's what marriage is meant to be. You bringing your whole self to your wife and, and you guys sharing life together on an intimate level. It robs you of that. It destroys your wife's self-esteem. She can't compete to fantasy. And, and, and then it corrupts your children's attitudes about sex. It's hurting you and others. We need to get that. Don't be deceived. I, I mean, you think about this. Our culture gets this with some things, but not with others. For instance, our culture gets it with drinking and driving, right? Everybody knows, don't drink and drive. Still do it, but they know not to because it's going to hurt you. It's going to hurt someone else. It's a bad choice. They get it with smoking, I mean, when I was a kid, smoking was cool. Now it's like the worst thing in the world, you know. Smoking causes cancer. We know that. It's got warning labels all over everything. So don't use it. Don't do it. We get that. Our culture gets it. But we don't get it with other things. Do you understand the consequences of our captivity to materialism? The fact that we love possessions more than people. Oh, not me. I don't love possessions more than people. I love my family. That's why I'm working so hard to, so I can get the things so that we can enjoy them as a family. So I'm ignoring my family so I can get the things so that we can have fun as a family. Because <laughs> that makes a lot of sense. And, and once we get there with the family, it's like, hey, don't touch that. <laughs> don't mess up my toy because it's, uh, it's nice. Or, or what about our slavery to debt? I mean, you know, we're, we just pile on and we're, we're living, you know, paycheck to paycheck and we're trying to make the minimum payment so that we can sustain this lifestyle that's obsessed with things that we don't need. Do we understand those consequences? Or do we understand the consequences of our slavery to image and appearance? I mean, do you realize what our culture is doing to our daughters? It's destroying them. Holding up these, these images. And, and how did we become a slave to people that we'll never meet? People that, that decide this is what fashion is. This is what Hollywood says it's supposed to look like. And, and they make this impossible image for, for girls to fit into. Let's just face it, women. You know, like less than one-tenth of one percent qualifies the way that they say that you're supposed to be for beauty. And, and then we curse our daughters because they see their moms in a place of self-loathing in front of the mirror. Hating their bodies, hating their body image and going, oh, look at that, this is terrible, oh, you get nothing to wear and I can't do this. And, and we, we pass this curse on generation to generation, but the last time I checked, there are plenty of babies being born, which means somebody is finding you attractive. <laughs> Am I right, guys? Yeah, see, see, we're not the ones going, hey, you should, you know, be a size nothing and, and do, and so... We, we need to recognize the consequences and, and, and recognize the consequences for our anger and our verbal abuse and our slander and our gossip because we're destroying the people around us. Do you see the responsibility for your pain? Do you recognize the prison that you're building for yourself and your family? And will you stop blaming others and let God change the direction of your life? See, our choices result in pain. And here's the good news. God redeems our pain. God redeems our pain. He takes the broken pieces of our life, the failures, the mistakes, the rebellion even, and, and he put, brings them together and he'll make something beautiful out of our lives. That's his promise. We, we see this in the Exodus event. God actually told Pharaoh in Exodus 9, 16, that, through Moses, this is what he said. For this purpose I have raised you up. To show you my power so that my name may be proclaimed in all the earth. 
God said, look, I'm doing this for two reasons. Number one, so I can set my people free. And when I set my people free, I'm going to make them a nation. And out of that nation is going to come Messiah. And he's going to be the one who sets all people free. Secondly, I'm doing these things so that you can know my power. He's the most powerful guy on the face of the earth at the time. And so that your people can know my power and my people can know my power. And all the nations can glorify the name of God, the one true living God. He says, I want them to know who I am. So the plagues demonstrated God's power and the people believed and they followed God to freedom. I want you to know that God is working in your life to redeem your pain if you're a follower of Jesus Christ. He he, he promises that he's doing that. He he is there demonstrating his power to you and, and he's inviting you to follow him to freedom. How do I know this? Because again, the Apostle Paul says so. Romans 8, 28. He says, and we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good. Now, it doesn't mean all things are good. It means that if you're a follower of Christ, then everything, God is going to take all those pieces and put them together and make something beautiful in your life. God is redeeming our pain. And so the pain of the plagues resulted in freedom for the Israelites. The pain of Jesus resulted in spiritual freedom for us. So how does God redeem our pain? How, what's he doing to, to make this happen? Okay, well, first of all, God heals the broken. Okay, heals the broken. Jesus is the great physician. And when he walked this earth, he touched bodies and he healed bodies. And he can still do that today. But in his death, he didn't just heal our bodies, he healed our souls. And so God heals the broken. And, and so in our pain, we can call out to God and, and ask for healing, and God will meet us in our pain. He doesn't abandon us. He doesn't avoid us. He meets us in our pain. And sometimes he touches us and he heals us miraculously. Sometimes people go, and they had cancer, and the next time they go, they don't have cancer. Or they found a condition, and the next time they go, the condition's not there. God heals them miraculously. That is so cool. But sometimes he doesn't heal our bodies. He simply heals our souls with that promise that one day we're going to get a new body. And that new body will never be corrupted by sin. It will never get tainted by death. It will never hurt or get old or break down or die. Sometimes, uh, you know, we pray for our loved ones. We ask God to heal them so that we don't have to lose them. And God heals them and we get to, to live life with them. And sometimes God just meets us there in our grief and reminds us that we grieve differently because we have the hope of the resurrection and glorious reunions that are to come. You see, God offers healing to our lives, to our souls, and he will heal the broken. And then God redeems our pain because God teaches character. God teaches character. Uh, Pain is a tremendous teacher, isn't it? I, I mean, hopefully we learn from our mistakes and our failures. Um, if not, Proverbs has a very unflattering name to call us. And if you don't know what that is, and simply put, it's a fool. You see, God uses our mistakes, God uses our failures to grow us up and teach us so that we can become more like Christ. That's what he did with the Apostle Peter, right? God taught Peter forgiveness and restoration out of Peter's denial of Jesus. Isn't that cool? The Apostle Paul learned submission and humility when God struck him blind on the road to Damascus. And then he sent him out to lead other people out of spiritual blindness. You see, that's what God does. He teaches us because our brokenness makes us eager students to learn from the Holy Spirit how it is we can walk with Christ and be like him. Uh, Again, I, I told you I quoted Celebrate Recovery to start this off, and I'm a fan of Celebrate Recovery And one of the things that they say a lot in Celebrate Recovery is this. God never wastes a hurt. God never wastes a hurt. What that means is God redeems our pain. And and he's not going to let it go to waste. If you're seeking him, he'll meet you in that pain. And he will teach you how to be somebody who's different than you are now. So God heals and God teaches. And amazingly, this is the coolest part of redemption, I think. God sends us to heal others. God sends us to heal others. This is the picture of redemption that is so beautiful, that is so powerful. We see it over and over and over again. The broken become the healers. Those who've been hurt become the comforters. The people who have failed become the teachers 
and the encouragers. And this truth is so important. I don't know if you realize this or not, but uh, a lot of the people you're seeing give their testimonies on the videos and you will see in the coming weeks are leaders here at Calvary. They're leaders of ministry. And, and, and if you think that, oh, well, I've messed up and I've made some mistakes and I've rebelled against God and so now all I can do is just come and sit in the pew and I can't do anything, then you don't understand redemption. God wants to, to heal your life. He wants to teach you his character and then he wants to send you to heal others. That, that's the way it works. That's his plan of redemption, and it's a beautiful plan, but we've got to be open to that. We've got to be looking for it because freedom is discovered going through the pain, not trying to escape the pain. And, and some of us in this room are so afraid of pain and conflict that we avoid it at all costs. All costs. Some of us are... Well, we have no real relationships because people could hurt you. You know, you do everything surface level, right? Out here, keep everybody at arm's length because if you let people get too close, they can put a knife in your back. If you let people get too close, they can betray you. They, they can hurt you. And so you're living life in a prison of loneliness. You're broken and your soul's crying out just like that little one back there. <laughs> and... and you know, and we can laugh because, you know, the, we hear the, the sound, but that's the sound that our hearts make because we're living life all alone. And you weren't created to live life all alone. You, you were created to be intimate with God. You were created for community with God's people. That's why I love life groups. I'm just going to tell you, it's easy to slip in here and, and sit in the back and, and just, hi, how you doing? Everything's good, fine, and leave. But when you sit in a small group with uh, a dozen people, they get to know you, and you get to know them, and they can love you, and you can love them, and you can share life together, and that's what God wants to do to bless you. You let some people in today and, and start on that journey to freedom. Some, some of you are, are so afraid of pain that you don't take any risks at all. You know, if there's any risk, physical risk, financial risk, whatever, you're just like, nope, not going to do it, not going to go there, and you're trying to live life avoiding pain, avoiding injury. You know, bubble wrap your children and send them off that way. And the truth is, God sometimes calls us to walk into dangerous places and to take the risk. Some are so filled with pain that you just want to escape. And, and you came here today and you're like, God, I need you to heal me. I need you to give, give me some relief from this pain. Otherwise, I'm going to go home and I'm going to try to numb it any way I can. With alcohol or drugs or food or sex or toys or work. Uh, you just, you just, you're afraid to feel anything. And I want you to know today that if that describes you, that God wants to redeem your pain. He is inviting you to take a difficult and wonderful journey to freedom. And if you don't know how to begin that, you, that sounds good to you, but you don't know where to start. You, you don't even know how to take the first step. Let me give you a couple of options. Uh, first of all, uh, have I mentioned Celebrate Recovery? <laughs> Tomorrow night at 6.30. They meet in this room, and it's a place where broken people come to take that journey to freedom. It's a place where they're really good at helping you to hold up the mirror and look at your life. And they can do that because they're on that journey too, and they're unashamed of it. And if you don't know where to start, that's a great place. Maybe your life is broken by grief, and you've lost someone, and you just can't get past that. On Tuesday nights, we have a group called Grief Share that meets. And they're just getting ready to start a whole new course going through the Grief Share. Wednesday nights, we've got a group called Divorce Care. If, you're, if your life has been shattered by divorce and you are broken and hurting, that's a place you can find healing. What I'm saying is there's opportunities to heal if you want to take that step. None of those work for you. We've got counselors that can meet with you that can help you figure out how to start the journey to freedom. Don't just stay there in your pain. Know that God is calling you out and we want to help you succeed in that journey to freedom. Now it brings us to the final point, and it's kind of a sticking point, it's actually why so many of us really don't end up taking the journey to freedom. And that's this. Freedom results from following God's direction. Period. Think back to the Passover. God said, here's what I'm going to do. Death angel is going to move through the land. Uh, and, and I want you to take a lamb, and I want you to kill the lamb, and I want you to take the blood, and I want you to put it on your doorpost, and I want you to uh, eat the lamb. Uh, you got to cook it a certain way. Uh, if you can't eat it all, get with some neighbors. You guys share it. Uh, here's what you're going to have with it. Here's how you're going to prepare it. Here's how you're going to dress for this event. Very clear directions. And, and, and if you did that, you lived. 
and you were on the journey to freedom. And if you didn't, then you suffered pain and death. And, and imagine how ridiculous it would have been if some of the, the Israelites would have said, hey, you know, the, the lamb is so cute. We don't, we don't want to kill the lamb. You know, it's kind of like a pet. Can we just, like, cut the hair all off of it and offer you that? And, and you know that blood on the doorpost thing, Scott? That just doesn't, that's so messy. Do you know how hard that is to clean blood off a doorpost? I mean, that's kind of gross, too. Can't we just put a sign up that says, no death angel here? Yeah, had they done that, they would have been touched by the death angel. Because God was providing them a path to freedom, but it was his path, and his path is the only one that works. And yet, how many times do we come to this place of decision where we go, God, I want you to change my life, and he tells us how he can change our lives, and we go, yeah, I don't like that plan. And we try to negotiate, we try to bring God our plan. Here, God, here's what I want you to bless, and I want to do it this way, and I want it to happen this way, and we fail. And we find ourselves living in the pain and in the captivity. And I'm just telling you, God wants to set you free, but the only way that it works is by following his direction. Because we don't have life figured out, do we? I mean, I'm still making mistakes. I'm still doing stupid things. That's just me. But when we listen to God, when we agree that he knows better, when we apply his truth to our lives, we find freedom. There's no place that is more obvious than this than just the whole point of salvation. You know, so many people in the world want to say, well, whatever path you choose, it all is good because they all lead to the same place. And, and the problem with that is that's not what God says. How, how about this? Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except by me. The Apostle Paul said, if we confess with our mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in our heart that God raised him from the dead, we'll be saved. Those are very clear statements, and, and, and there's many more that go with it. And here's the thing. If we want to be forgiven of our sins and have eternal life, then there's one option and one option only to do it God's way, and that is to confess Jesus as your Savior and Lord, to ask him to take away your sins and commit your life to following him. It, it doesn't work with you coming and saying, God, I'm going to be a good person, and, and I think Jesus is cool, but I'm not going like, you know, to follow him. And, and I'm going to go to church because I like the people there, and, and it's all going to be good, right? No. It's not. And maybe there's some of you here today that need to take that first step on that journey to freedom. And you need to say, Jesus, you're my Lord and I'm going to follow you. And you need to get up there in those waters just like you saw earlier this service. And you need to say, I don't care who knows about it. I am an unashamed follower of Christ. And you need to start your journey of freedom that way. For those of you who are already followers of Jesus Christ, you probably know what God is telling you to do. I always do. He's, he's, he's always convicting me about some part of my life that I'm trapped in. And he's saying, hey, I want you to change this. I want you to give this up. I want you to break this habit. I, I want you to start in this uh, you know, process of following me. Maybe it's a task he wants you to do so that you can start healing others. If you listen to him, he's going to lead you to life. And if you don't, then you can stay in your pain and captivity. And the amazing thing is God gives you and I this choice. So do you want God to change your life? Or do you want to continue living in the pain? Jesus died so that we could choose life. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your love and your mercy and your grace. Thank you for giving us endless second chances. We need them. And Lord, I pray today that we would hear your voice, each and every one of us, and we would, with courage and faith, say yes to you, and that we would experience that freedom and that life change that we so desperately want and need. This is our prayer in Jesus' name, amen.